Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're so excited to have so many awesome people joining us um, for our quarterly All Hands. Uh, my name is Caroline Sawyers. I serve as team co-coordinator for Right to Health Action. Um, we're so excited to bring together new and existing members of our community for this quarterly gathering and really share together what we have accomplished as well as providing opportunities to take action and connecting with each other. Um, so to start us off, um, we're so excited to be welcoming Kadita Kenner here to share her story, really about what we really need um, so badly to stop COVID and repeal and replace policies of inequality that have gotten us here. Um, so a little bit of background on Kadita. She's the executive director of the New Pennsylvania Project, a member of Pennsylvania Governor Wolf's subcommittee on racial equality for COVID vaccines, as well as a long hauler for COVID-19. Thank you so much for being here for, with us tonight, Kadita. Over to you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. As was mentioned, my name is Kadita Kenner, and I am a COVID survivor. Like many who contracted COVID, uh, is something that I never thought uh, that would come my way. I was living my best life for the most part. Uh, you know, like many, I stayed in the house. Uh, for much of March, April, May, June, July, and August. Started coming out the house a little bit more in September. Uh, it was my birthday month. And I've even traveled. Went, I, I currently live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I traveled to Louisiana, New Orleans. I traveled to Florida in those months and was living my best life, uh, but still taking precautions, wearing a mask, taking all the precautions that were necessary to keep myself safe. And then we got really focused into the election work and I was back home working in my home office like so many do. And in November, I organized uh, with some other folks there in Harrisburg, an event there that you're seeing in that picture, uh, which shows you that we organized the Count Every Vote rally. This was on November 4th, the day after the election. And this was an event to ensure that we were counting every vote, that our voices were heard and that we had an accurate election based upon the fact that we did have a free and fair election. And if you can see that photo there in the center, those were counter protesters that attended our event and they were all unmasked and came from all over the country. And in order to get down those steps and into my office, I had to walk through all of those folks who had lots to say to me because I was a speaker at the event. Um, it was pretty, pretty well known that I was one of the organizers of that event. And so lots of folks there wanted to have up close and personal conversations with me. And it is my belief that I caught COVID on November 4th um, as an organizer of this event. So I wanna share with you a little bit about my experience with COVID um, as a healthy individual, no pre-existing conditions, Never someone who's had to spend any time in the hospital uh, besides some minor knee surgery from being a college athlete. I found myself uh, with a curious case of COVID and I was tested on the 10th of November. So just almost a week after the Count Every Vote rally because I had a cough. I had a little cough, no fever, no other symptoms that you always hear about. I had a little cough. But I had heard that some other folks that attended the rally had contracted COVID, particularly the news crews. I think the NBC news crew had also contracted COVID. So I just wanted to take a precaution and get a test. I did test positive for COVID. And then the symptoms uh, started kicking in about two days after my diagnosis. Like many black women, um, you know, we fear sometimes going to the doctors. We're not always treated the best. Um, our, our pain is not always recognized. Our symptoms are not always recognized. And so I did have a fear of the doctors. Uh, that comes out of an experience of actually attending um, or actually going to the doctors. At one particular point, I had a broken elbow and the doctor did not want to prescribe me any pain medication. He didn't think I needed any, even though I said I was on a nine out of 10 pain level. And once he did actually prescribe me a few pills, he told me not to sell them. So that's kind of the experience I've had uh, through the years, uh, experiencing uh, with the medical establishment. So I had a fear here of doctors. So when I wasn't feeling well, really well with COVID, I, I put aside the inkling that I actually should go and seek medical attention. I did that a lot. And finally, the day before Thanksgiving, I decided that um, I was going to go and seek some urgent care because I was having really difficult breathing. Throughout my COVID experience, I, I've, Pretty much for the most part felt as though I had a 300 pound man on my chest 
for most of my experience. So I went to uh, urgent care to make sure I didn't have pneumonia. They did a test, uh, they did an x-ray. I did not have pneumonia, but they told me if I didn't feel well, then to go to the emergency room. Thanksgiving came and I hadn't seen my parents for a long time. They live about an hour and a half away from me. And they came and they delivered a Thanksgiving plate for me. I hadn't eaten real food in a very long time. And so they delivered the food for me, dropped it off in front of my door and we waved at each other. They were in the car, I was at home. I enjoyed that Thanksgiving plate. It was so long since I had, had food <laughs> and I probably overdid it that evening. And I was lucky enough that I have one of my girlfriends from high school is a medical doctor. I called her that evening because I was having difficult breathing and she told me I should go to the hospital the next day to the emergency room. So that's what I did. And if you're someone like myself who lives alone, you do a lot of things alone. I had to drive myself to the emergency room the day after Thanksgiving at 7.30 in the morning. I heard that's when there was a shift change and that's what I should go. And I parked my car in the parking lot of Hershey Medical. And I took a picture of where I parked my car and I texted it to my father to let him know where my car was parked in case I never came back out of the hospital for him to know where my car was parked. And I went into the hospital on the day after Thanksgiving and you saw that picture earlier. And luckily for me, I did not have to stay very long. Um, my oxygen levels weren't at the level at which they need to keep you. And it was always my fear that if I got checked in, I would never check back out. So lucky for me, I didn't have a blood clot. They did all the good tests that they're supposed to do. I had great service actually in Hershey Medical. Uh, the nurses were very caring. My nurse actually, I was her first COVID patient. She just got back from um, maternity leave. And that experience changed my life. Um, I held uh, uh, on Facebook, I'm very active on Facebook. And I wanted to make sure that others weren't feeling some kind of shame or stigma about contracting COVID. It seemed to be a lot of that. I had a lot of people in my inbox saying, I had COVID or my brother had COVID and, and really whispering this to me. So I did a COVID Chronicles on Facebook every day. It's the one activity I, I did myself throughout my COVID times. Sometimes it took me 30 minutes to do, sometimes it took me two minutes to do because it was hard. Those days were hard. Um, it took, you know, I, my brain wasn't functioning, but I wanted to let the folks know that I was doing okay or, or I wasn't doing okay. And I, till this day, I still suffer a little bit from PTSD around the fact that I had to do so much of this alone um, as, a, as a woman who lives alone. And so I wanted to make sure that we're sharing these stories about our COVID experience. And I am a long hauler. I still experience brain fog. As a rule, I try not to plan anything for myself before 10 in the morning. And me doing this event tonight after eight o'clock is something I typically don't do. Because as someone who communicates for a living, I find it a little difficult to communicate in words sometimes and pull together sentences, string the words together, find the words to say. And so that's one of my COVID symptoms along with the fact that, you know, I still have trouble breathing at times. For some reason now I have a fear of height <laughs> that I never had before. Um, and so many other, other things that have come out of this COVID experience for myself and the impact that it's had on my daily life and my job. Um, lucky for me, I work for an organization that allowed me to take as much time as I needed. The last thing I'll say here is that the next big struggle for those who are suffering from long haul symptoms is the fact that there's so many of us who do not qualify for workers comp. Uh, my insurance company through my job declined me. Um, luckily for me, my job is going to pay my medical bills because they do feel as though I contracted COVID while working. But so many are not going to be as lucky as me. So many are being declined workers comp claims from their insurance companies because they cannot prove the exact moment they caught COVID. So those who are out there working on the front line, those who are bagging groceries, those who are working in retail, those who are stocking shelves, medical professionals, um, they're going to have issues years from now. And so we need to talk about this and work on this issue now because what is gonna to happen to all those long haulers years from now when they're still suffering that they have no medical remedy or, or ways to, to cover the cost so I thank you all for listening to me tonight and letting me share my COVID story. I'm just one of many. I'm a lucky one. My body was healthy enough to, to let me come out of COVID alive. I had a job that blessed me with time off to allow me to recover. And I'm excited to be able to share my story with all of you tonight. And I hope that you all share your stories as well with Ava. Thank you.
Wow, thank you so much, Kadita, for sharing your powerful story with us. I think it really highlights the urgent need that there that exists to ensure that such a pandemic never happens again and people don't have to go through what you've gone through. Um, I want to introduce myself really quickly. Um, my name is Akshita Sadula. I'm the Community Organizing Director for Right to Health Action. And before we hand it over to our guest speaker tonight, I wanted to share with the new members of our Right to Health community what we've been working on for the past couple months. So uh, just over a year ago, Right to Health Action was formed during that first US lockdown when COVID started last March. Um, and we came together based on the shared belief that pandemics are the product of policies and that this pandemic was exposing really fatal flaws in our healthcare systems. And we wanted to be the crowbar in that crack to pry it open and get to the root causes and repeal the policies that are perpetuating this wave of increasingly deadly pandemics. You know, we wanted to do something uh, and not just talk about it. We wanted to make a change. And we knew that we couldn't stop COVID-19 anywhere until we've stopped it everywhere, which is how we came uh, to develop the People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. Um, this is a policy package of strategies that really works to leverage this current moment to win some real transformative changes that we need to not only stop COVID, but to also prevent a sequel from happening in the next couple of years. In this policy agenda, we are fighting for a couple of big things. Um, first, we're trying to address uh, and combat racial health disparities in the United States uh, by establishing a permanent public health core. Um, these would be organizers placed directly in the communities that need them the most and, and working to support those that are the most vulnerable and already poor and already sick. We're also uh, fighting to make sure that corporations that are making the world sick um, by you know, pillaging the natural resources in poor, impoverished countries just to benefit their own cheap supplied labor. Um, we want to make sure that they, those corporations are not uh, able to sell their goods in the U.S. market. And we want to really invest in a global fund where we're able to provide financial support to indigenous communities that are living and working uh, on this front line where uh, environmental degradation and um, you know, a deforestation are uh, directly contributing to the zoonotic transmission of diseases. So we wanna make sure that these communities have the resources they need to fight back. And then lastly, we're also really working to ensure that our private drug companies that exist that have monopolies on the medicines and the vaccines that US taxpayer dollars are used um, to develop and invent these drugs and vaccines, um, we want to make sure that these medicines and life-saving technology is made open globally to everybody so that poor countries have the capacity to make their own medicines and vaccines, not just for COVID, but well beyond COVID. Uh, I think what's most remarkable about all of this uh, work that we've been doing and the, the progress that we've been able to accomplish is that we have done this with exactly zero dollars. We have uh, no paid staff as of yet. There are no fancy consultants that help us do this work, no big grants, nothing. Uh, we've done this completely through uh, digital shoe leather organizing. We asked our friends to join. We've been building coalitions with partner organizations and we're just fighting for what's right. And I think we're a living experiment in pandemic era democracy, a true organic grassroots organization. Um, since we've come together, we've accomplished quite a lot as a team. Uh, our organizers have met with members of Congress from across the country over a thousand times in the past year. And we've sent 362,000 letters um, to members of Congress urging the creation of policies that will end this pandemic and prevent future pandemics. We've also um, organized more than 100 meetings between grassroots leaders and constituents like yourself and with members of Congress, their representatives. And we do this every single month. We've also been a part of um, drafting and editing over a dozen bills, um, a WHO resolution, and also work to edit executive orders and have twice been able to enlist the majority of the majority in Congress to join us and endorse our People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. Our most recent effort last month was able to get 121 co-sponsors, um, so that's members of Congress who've signed on for the creation of a global pandemic prevention fund. Outside of Congress and the Biden administration, we've really tried to focus our energies on education and conversation. Um, many of the events that we host, like the one today, is 
working to host conversations with uh, our constituents, our community, and uh, in conversation with leading experts in this field doing this work. Uh, we've held events in the past with Dr. Paul Farmer, with Larry Krasner, and uh, next month we'll be hosting our 10th our webin all about global vaccine access and intellectual property rights. We've also held community events with Senator Kristen Gillibrand, Professor Jeff Sachs, and uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Lastly, um, earlier this month, we also very significantly exceeded our very first fundraising goal of $100,000 in the first 100 days of Biden's presidency. This funding will allow us to pay some of our members for this crucial work, as well as cover our organizational costs. So thank you so much, everyone here, for being a part of this quarterly movement meeting. We're so honored to have you joining us. Uh, our keynote speaker for tonight is Lori Wallach. Lori is the director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, a 25-year veteran of congressional trade battles starting with the 1990s fight over NAFTA. She was named to the Politico's 50 list of thinkers, doers, and visionaries, transforming American politics in 2016 for her leadership with the Trans-Pacific Partnership debate. Lori is an internationally recognized expert on trade with experience advocating in Congress and foreign parliaments, trade negotiations, courts, government agencies, the media, and in the streets. She's been dubbed the trade debates guerrilla warrior in a National Journal profile, um, and was also called Ralph Nader with a sense of humor in a Wall Street Journal profile. She combines a lawyer's expertise on the terms and outcomes of agreements with insight from the front lines and a street brawler sensibility of where and when to punch to say, knock out the WTO. Lori's specialty is translating arcane trade issues into accessible language. She's a lawyer who's worked in television news and on political campaigns. Lori has also testified with NAFTA, WTO, and other globalization issues before 30 congressional committees and addressed the 2017 G20 summit and written numerous books on trade. We're so honored to have her here today to share with us her perspective. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Lori. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, Akshita, thank you for the very gracious introduction. And Kadita, thank you for sharing your story, which was very compelling and makes just clear why we are all here tonight and why we are working and why Right to Health Action is a great bottom up operation of folks who can prove it's people power that makes the change. So the thing that I was very thrilled to be able to work with my old friend, Paul Davis. I shouldn't say old, but he and I met each other when we neither of us were gray. Um, uh, in many of these great street fights on trade, um, the, the fight that we were, were just working on and all of you were just working on is something that we actually had a victory on that, you know, we need to celebrate our victories because that builds our enthusiasm and our power. And then think about what the hell we have to do more <laughs> because it's a multi-stage thing, um, is the fight to try and get the Biden administration to make a historic change and support a temporary COVID-19 emergency waiver of the boneheaded, corporate rigged, pharma loving rules of the WTO that are officially called the Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property. If that sounds like a cure for insomnia, which we will call TRIPS, it really actually is a power tool against public health. It is in the middle of a free trade agreement, the World Trade Organization, a set of new monopoly rights that the pharmaceutical companies got rigged into the agreement. So what that set of rules, the TRIPS agreement requires is that every single country that signs a WTO, so you wanna do trade, then you have to sign into this handcuff agreement that requires that every single country agree to give extensive monopoly powers to big pharma, which in the context of this pandemic, boil down to countries being required by a free trade agreement to give protectionist monopolies to a handful of pharmaceutical corporations who then have absolute control over if and how much vaccine, COVID treatment, tests are made 
where they are sold, and at what price. And refusing, if a country fails to do that, their actual trade is cut off <laughs> and they face sanctions. So like imagine an environmental treaty or a human rights treaty that basically, if you didn't follow it as a country, it's off with your head. That is what the TRIPS agreement does with pharma monopolies. And the place that it smacks into and flattens public health, no more so than a pandemic, is you've got a global hundred, once in a century, hundred year crisis of desperately needing treatments, vaccines, tests, yet 160 WTO countries, basically almost the entire world has the pharma handcuffs on. So last October, South Africa and India, South Africa who saw what the TRIPS agreement did during the HIV AIDS crisis, sentencing people to death, where in the rich countries, if you could afford it, antiretrovirals made HIV a lifetime disease, but treatable, chronic. And a death sentence of a horrible, painful death in the developing world because these monopoly rules let the pharmaceutical companies have the prices so high, people couldn't afford it in Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America and a lot of Asia. So really great campaigners had a huge knockdown drag out at the WTO and they got a agreement that gave some flexibilities for HIV AIDS meds. And it made a fantastic difference. So South Africa had lived through that. South Africa is the epicenter of that. South Africa led that fight the last time. So they got their colleague, India, a country that has many generic vaccine and other medicine makers of international quality. And they together proposed a COVID-19 emergency waiver. I mean, if you don't do it now, when the hell are you going to like knock out the pharma rules for the sake of public health? So you would assume that this is not really a hard sale. And in fact, in relatively short order, about 50 other countries at the WTO joined in. But probably not so shocking, the Trump administration, on behalf of pharma, recruits a handful of other countries. The European Union shows up as a whole block. It's not country by country. So the whole European Union, Switzerland, they kind of drag Canada in. They get Norway. They got Brazil, which is really depressing, right-wing government. And there's literally a handful of countries that are doing the big ixnay. And the way the WTO works is you have to have consensus to do anything. So that handful of asshat countries basically puts the emergency break on the entire negotiation. There are a hundred countries that desperately need vaccines, treatments, and tests. And because that handful of countries will not let them start a negotiation to have the things that those countries that are stopping the negotiations, the rich ones at least, already have a plan to have bought and going to have those vaccines. So right through the Trump administration, they blocked that whole process. Won't even let the negotiations start about this waiver. It's not rocket science. Basically, the actual waiver is one page. It says, for the duration of this pandemic, these following rules will be suspended to the extent they are necessary for the production of medical products necessary to detect, to treat, and to prevent COVID-19. Not a hard thing, political problem, not a legal problem, not a medical problem, power problem. So the Biden administration comes in, there is no trade representative for a while, there are a bunch of corporate types lurking around, pharma thinks it's gonna rule the roost, and in comes all kinds of excellent activist groups who decide, you know something? Biden promised Audie Barker and a whole bunch of other people live, he's not gonna let these intellectual property monopolies get in the way of global access to particularly COVID vaccines. So, you know, there has been for 30 years around the world, science is collaborating, mRNA vac research, including for vaccines, not just for this, for malaria. There's HIV AIDS treatments based in mRNA. It's amazing technology and scientists have been collaborating all over the world on this. So basically this was the moment when actually after all of this collaborative work, we had this amazing new kind of potential vaccine when we needed it. And relatively quickly from like, we'd never make an mRNA vaccine ever, to like the fall of last year, they have enough to start doing trials. It's a damn miracle in three to four months, they got these lines up. And as of May 1st, 1 1.5 billion doses made from like dead start.
So this can be done. It can be done relatively quickly. It actually doesn't take as long as some of the other vaccines that you literally have, have to get replicating virus cells in a vat. And it literally has to like, this is all synthetic chemistry. So here's this miracle. It could save millions of lives. And these corporations will not agree to be paid, license, get paid by developing country producers who are qualified and can make it because they want their monopoly. Because if you're Pfizer, you publicly announce your real game is next year to sell boosters, not for the 20 bucks they negotiate with the US government for the first shots, but for $175 a shot in rich countries. You don't want any other countries to be able to make that stuff. You are happy to let people just die <laughs> and not share. So there is probably 2 billion doses of capacity just sitting out there in the global south in qualified manufacturers where the companies just won't give the recipes, help share the technology. So the TRIPS waiver, again, that's the key. That opens the door. There's a shit ton of other stuff that has to happen, right? To make it fast, you need technology transfer. To actually get the lines going, there's going to be investment in manufacturing. But the key that unlocks all of that monopoly is the TRIPS waiver. So historically, the U.S. has been on the wrong side. Since pharma got to rig trade agreements with monopolies, again, the philosophers of free trade, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, rolling in graves, free trade agreement with protectionist monopolies. Yes, since that happened, that hijacking, which happened in the early 90s under Bill Clinton, the U.S. has been on the wrong side of this Democratic and Republican president. So it is a phenomenal moment that actually, after a ton of campaigning to pave the way for President Biden to follow through in his damn promise, with a little bit of loving kick in the pants, I might add, with tons of rallies, a unbelievable number, many of them generated by you and your colleagues of petitions, of letters to Congress, of 110, half the House Democrats, getting on a letter saying, Mr. President, there is no other thing to do but this thing. You help get those members of Congress, some of whom were really not looking forward to having to get on the right side of history on this one, but you made them, and that's what's people power. You made them represent you, not pharma. Enough work was done so that the wonderful new U.S. trade representative, who is a woman named Catherine Tai, who's on our side, we helped pave the way for her to do the things she'd want to do, and she made the whole damn administration do it. And we can thank her mightily. We should thank the Biden administration. We achieved a damn historic thing that, as I heard from many a friend in Geneva, where the WTO is, when this announcement came, literally like objects were being dropped. People were dropping briefcases. People were dropping teacups. People were like, what? Impossible. It was like one of those holy shit moments. And we did that. We did that as activists. That is, that is we beat pharma. That is phenomenal. So we should celebrate ourselves for that. And we should celebrate the administration because that was a brave thing to do because they could know what was gonna happen next, a total shitstorm of pharma. So you've seen all these ads, you know, these are the companies that have, that spend a record amount of lobbying money, literally tens of millions just for the quarter who have tens of millions in advertisement going on and they are beating the living crap out of Biden. So our next mission now, we have this big shift that created momentum, that had other countries like the UK and others say, all right, uncle, we give up, we're with the US. If they're doing it, we're doing it too. There are still some holdouts. So this is what we still have to do. And I call this the thanks, hug, and squeeze campaign because we need to thank them and appreciate them and elevate what the administration did. It's transformational, it changes the whole dynamic, right? When the US was over there with all the other rich countries in Brazil, the whole thing was screwed. With the U.S. on this side, it just entirely changes the power dynamic. However, when I say squeeze, there are still a bunch of countries that are in the wrong place. <laughs> so we need to keep doing the work here to be supporting what the Biden administration did, because part of the work they have to do is get the other countries to do the right thing. There are partners, brothers and sisters in all these other countries who are having kind of meaning we're having right now in numerous other languages. It's a global movement that we are part of. And they are plotting to do the same thing if their countries have not already shifted. There is a kick-ass operation in the European Union. There is an amazing bunch of folks in Brazil where it is dangerous and hard to be an activist again. There are people all over the world who are doing this damn work, and they're going to get their governments to do the same thing. And then what we need to do, 
we need to make sure that there is a waiver adopted. So we got the U.S. on the right side. That does not make for a waiver. We have to get the waiver adopted. We have to get adopted quickly. This can't be horsing around until December in some long diplomatic blah, blah. We need to make sure it covers what needs to be covered, which is all the IP barriers that are blocking vaccines, treatments, and diagnostic tests. And we need to do that by helping, again, pave the road number two, just like we did pave the road number one. Number one action item for this is going to be a congressional resolution. It's a resolution that starts off by thanking the Biden administration and castigating pharma for what they've been doing. They've created this shortage. The world needs 10 to 15 billion doses of vaccine to get global herd immunity. Right now, at the end of the year, they may be at five or six billion doses. We're not close. There's going to have to be more manufacturing. That's the only way this is going to work. So we need to get the waiver done. We need to get the good waiver done. We need it not to be lallygagging. And at the same time, we need to be working for what's called technology transfer. So there's all the stuff that's literally under the patent monopolies. If you like take the formula or you break the copyright for the computer program, that's like a, in a lot of countries, that's like a criminal violation of law. But then there's the know-how. And that's information that isn't necessarily under one of these forms of intellectual property monopoly, but that's the difference between does it take the next companies that can be making billions of doses three months to get a new mRNA line popping out of half a, half a billion doses, or is it going to take trial and error for six months or eight months or whatever as people die? Can't have that happy horseshit. We need them to transfer the technology. And to get that done, there are two things. One, there is pressure. There is pharma. Here's what's going to happen to you, for instance, under the Defense Production Act. If you continue with this bullshit, they're getting paid. Stuff's not getting stolen. <laughs> they're going to get paid per the dose. It's called a royalty. It's just whether their greed is going to allow them to get paid to do the thing that saves humanity. So will they do technology transfer and then the manufacturing? So there is going to have to be money. Some of it is going to come from development banks. Some of it's going to come from charities. Some of it's going to have to come from the rich country governments. And we're going to have to make more here, make more there. And we need hubs. We need hubs of, of producers who can make mRNA technology-based vaccines around the world, not only because that's the only way we're going to stay on top of the variants, which, by the way, is our business. Like, the people on this call, you don't need to hear this. But when you're, like, when you're arguing with, like, your aunt, uncle, sister, or cousin who's not quite in the same place politically, why is this for us? Because we have been very blessed to have these vaccines. But we are one variant away from total lockdown and chaos again. You get a vaccine-resistant variant can brew any place there is raging COVID, right? So if you're not an ethical person, if you're not a moral person, and you're thinking just about yourself, and you don't want to spend another year with your kids, then you want to think about the fact that you have to have around the world no hot spots of outbreaks or variants that could include a vaccine-resistant variant will hatch. It will bring down the global economy forever. It will bring us back into a situation where we start over. This is our problem. It's not just the morally right thing to do. This is the only way forward, and it's a race between variants and vaccines, and we're behind in the race. So the manufacturing money, the tech transfer, but first the key that unlocks it all is we actually have to secure the TRIPS waiver that is of the right size. And that will translate the fastest end to the pandemic. That is how we get shots in arms. That is how we get more ventilators made for all those people who we know are gonna get sick between now and then, and we get them the monoclonal antibodies and other treatments that can help them survive, that keeps the economy going, that cuts down the debt. We can all do this. And it's people power around the world that is going to do this. And so very soon, this new resolution will go in. We'll be asking all of our members of Congress to sign it. That will be both sort of a loving, um, really safety in numbers to the, the Biden administration. A farmer may be having a total hissy fit about protect greed, don't protect human lives. But here you have on paper, millions of Americans and half the Congress, because we're gonna do it again, that are for that. And that's our mission, to actually deliver what was an amazing victory into the change that we need. And I see there is, I'm looking just to see, I think I might be out of time. Yes, I am, because if there are questions, we could do some questions. But um, I think there are, 
more here here's and less questions. So if folks would like to, to ask me a question, please email me at lwallach, L-W-A-L-L-A-C-H at citizen.org. I'm the Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch, lwallach at citizen.org. And just one resource, if you wanna like wrangle with an ornery Congress critter. Generally, we have members of Congress, we love them, we're respectful, we fight with them sometimes, but there are a handful of those who go into the critter category and you have to like fight line by line. Go to tradewatch.org. And we have a set of fact sheets, talking points, wonkification, de-wonkification, every lie that's ever been told and the counter to the lie, then the counter to the lie that's told about the counter to the lie. So we are a bunch of lawyers who have very fast typing fingers. So tradewatch.org, go to the COVID Resources Center. And there's also places there where there are a bunch of like action ideas of other things you can do if you really want to get into it. So thank you all so much for including me. And it's really a pleasure and so and exciting to see a group of all volunteers so engaged um, fighting for everything that we really need for the future. Thank you, Lori, for that inspiring presentation. My, my name is Chris Noble. I'm an organizer with Right to Health Action, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what, what we can do right now in this unique political moment that we find ourselves in. Um, and this moment, and I just wanted to say thank you, Lori, for that presentation, and also for your leadership in this space. You're truly an inspiration, and you're inspiring the masses right now to do what needs to get, to get done to really get us out of this pandemic and prevent them into the future. So thank you for your leadership. Um, so as I said, we're in a very unique political moment. You know, it calls on all of us to continue to hold our elected officials accountable to pass the People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. You know, now that Lori has provided some context for the urgency of this work, I wanna spend the next few minutes sharing some actions that we can take with us as soon as next week. People here on the call can take with us as soon as next week to advocate for ending COVID everywhere and preventing the next pandemic in its tracks. So last month, as Akshita mentioned, Right to Health Action organized a successful lobbying push where grassroots leaders from across the country were able to recruit 120 House members, that's a majority of the majority of our House leadership, to join a bipartisan congressional sign-on letter in support of launching a new $20 billion global fund for pandemic prevention. This fund is a dedicated multilateral financing mechanism that will support poor countries and frontline communities with the resources they need to build health systems strong enough to fight, stop outbreaks from spreading at the source in these zoonotic hotspots, enact pandemic prevention plans, and stop spillovers, spillovers from happening in the first place. So that's, here's where we can come in. Now, last month, we got the House on board for a historic new global fund to pandemic-proof the planet. Next week, starting this Monday, we're taking it to the Senate, and we need all hands on deck. This quarterly meeting isn't called all hands for nothing. We truly need everyone here on the call to be taking action. So please comment in the chat if this is something you wanna get involved with. We, and you're, in a moment, we're gonna connect you with your state captains and regional organizers to get you involved. But if you're really feeling this and you wanna get involved, talk in the chat and we'll make sure to get you connected. But as I said, everyone here should expect an email in the next few days with an invitation to join these grassroots meetings with your senator's staffers to advocate for this global pandemic prevention fund. These grassroots meetings are a great way for you to share why pandemic prevention matters directly with your representatives. A Right to Health organizer will be present to prepare you and the rest of the team from your state, answer questions and run the meeting so you don't have to worry about those logistics. And if you haven't done this before, that's totally fine. We will be there to support you. It is essential that you share, you show these constituent people power in these meetings. So these legislators, I'm sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought. So the legislators know that their constituents are watching and need them to stand on the right side of history. And last, but certainly not least, as Lori shared with us, what needs to be done to stop vaccine apartheid and protect everyone everywhere. On May 5th this year, the Biden administration took a historic step in the right direction by supporting negotiation for a TRIPS waiver of drug company monopolies on the people's COVID-19 vaccine. This is a, the Moderna vaccine particularly was 100% funded by our taxpayer dollars. It is truly our property. And now it is up to our government to help get our people's vaccine out to the world. But we must remain vigilant. 
on this front, since many countries in the European Union, as Lori mentioned, and elsewhere are still blocking these efforts. And history has shown that when past negotiations on similar intellectual property exemptions have happened, it's resulted in unworkable systems that are rarely used and largely ineffective. We have to maintain the pressure. And it's also reported that the TRIPS waiver itself would only temporarily ensure that international law doesn't stand in the way to manufacture, export, and import COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. And we already know that we'll be needing boosters on an ongoing basis beyond this acute stage and in instances for future outbreaks. Additionally, we know that there's a Pfizer therapeutic candidate in production right now that would be a fast and direct beneficiary of this waiver and that we could see expanded production immediately due to this, it has a much simpler manufacturing process. All this to be said, monopolies are the central bottleneck slowing global vaccinations and therapeutic treatments and this first step was a very big deal. But now, and now that progress is being made on this front, the United States must step in and lead a global effort to support rapid scale up of manufacturing hubs to quickly increase vaccine production and supply. So that brings us exactly to what we're gonna be working on this June, particularly specifically the week of June 14th to, the, to 18th, when we'll be pushing hard on our members of Congress to get President Biden to immediately launch a vaccine manufacturing program that will radically expand vaccine supply and vaccinate the world as quickly as possible. In order for this program to be successful, it must include a few very specific things. This first, this TRIPS waiver that we've seen progress on must include all private intellectual property rights around COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, as well as testing. This is very similar to the proposal that the South Af that South Africa and India proposed back in back in October. So we hope to follow our, our comrades in the global South and their leadership and hope to get something passed as close to that original model as possible. Now, number two, Joe Biden will also need to use his already existing executive authority to force a rapid transfer of publicly funded intellectual property and technological know-how. And number three, the US government must support a massive expansion of manufacturing through investments in trusted and untapped manufacturers throughout the global south. We are fighting to democratize production and improve global health security to not just end COVID-19 as quickly as possible, but also to develop the adaptive technologies such as these mRNA platforms that are critical to defeating the next pandemic. This effort will truly require a global coordinated response unlike the world has ever seen. This victory is a transformative one. Getting pharma out of the way and restoring balance that was taken by the corporations who have privatized and monopolized public research, building industrial capacity in poor countries is a change that will last long beyond COVID-19 and it will take all of us worldwide to make something this big happen. Every moment that passes without this program in place means countless more loved ones who are lost who could have been protected and an increased risk of potential virus variants that evolve resistance to our current arsenal of vaccines, which threatens security everywhere, including here in the United States. There are tons of opportunities to plug in and starting next week and again in mid-June, these opportunities are right here in front of us. So your state captains will be reaching out via email in the next few days to share more details about these actions to help pass the People's Pandemic Prevention Plan. But first, Right now, we will get the ball rolling by giving everyone a chance to connect with their state captains and other organizers in their state. Thank you for your commitment to a pandemic-free world and future. We need everyone here to get involved to make this happen. I'm now going to hand it over to Caroline to transition us to our small group portion of our meeting, which is so important to begin taking action today. Thank you.